Thank you all for coming this evening. I want to welcome the students in the class and the community members who are here for the second of our guest lectures in Food Literacy all, for All this winter. Just a reminder to those of you who are not enrolled that we'd love to have you continue coming to, the, uh, to our presentations. Please be sure to RSVP on our Food Literacy website because that enables us to document how many people are attending and that's very helpful for our, just our general feedback but also for future support for the class. Um, I just want to remind us before we get into the details for tonight uh, who are the sponsoring units for this, this entire lecture series, a number of them from within the university and also beyond. Thank you very much for making all of this possi possible. A few public announcements. We have a food summit coming up um, in uh, next month, Monday, February 19th, the local food summit. It has a website. It's always a really interesting um, event with both, with often with you know luminary guest speakers from afar as well as a whole bunch of presenters from th this area talking about the various successes and efforts that they have underway. So um, very interesting and we encourage you to attend. I want to call up Jennifer who's going to talk about this new, um, this, this forthcoming event organized by students on campus. Hi everybody, my name is Jennifer Carmen. I'm from the Michigan University-wide Sustainability and Environment, or MUSE, initiative. I'm just here to let you guys know that registration is open for our annual MUSE conference. This is an internal conference for University of Michigan faculty, staff, students, and researchers to share sustainability-related research going on at the university. But we are also hosting a pub, and that, that uh, conference is on the 14th and 15th of February at the Michigan League, but we are also hosting a public reception that's open to everyone on the evening of February 15th and that's going to include an author's talk by Claire Vay Watkins about her novel Gold Fame Citrus um, and both of these events are free but both events do require registration so if you are interested in attending for the conference go to muse-initiative.umich.edu slash conference and for the uh, for the public reception go to bit.ly muse 2018 reception thanks Great. thank you thank you Jennifer and one more public announcement from the Food Recovery Network that is a, um, a student-led organization having a mass meeting, uh, mass meetings uh, Wednesday. The next one will be Wednesday tomorrow at 8 p.m. Um, in Mason Hall in the Perlman Honors Commons. So lots of interesting um, things happening, student organized on campus that are food related. Well, I would like to introduce now our um, our, our speaker for tonight, Josh Slotnick, who is coming to us somewhat heroically tonight after missed flights, canceled flights, delayed flights, just literally walked in five minutes ago from the airport. And this that wasn't the way things were planned, but that's the way it worked out tonight. So thank you so much, Josh. He's coming to us from Missoula, Montana, a beautiful town nestled in the Rocky Mountains in western Montana, where he is director of the Pease Farm and, fac and faculty at the University of Montana in the Environmental Studies Program. Now, PEAS, P-E-A-S, stands for Program in Ecological Agriculture and Society. I love that title. I think that's wonderful. Now, this is an urban farm that is a partnership between the university's Environmental Studies Program and a nonprofit organization in Missoula, the Garden City Harvest, which provides food to low-income families through the Missoula Food Bank. And students who work on the farm gain experience in both growing healthy food and providing important services to the local community. So they're able to merge those two different goals together. The farm hosts programs for school children, a youth development program, and classroom experiences for college students. Josh has a master's degree in agricultural extension and adult education from Cornell University. He teaches courses in appropriate technology in culture and agriculture, drawing upon literature, the arts, and natural sciences and philosophy in his courses. He is also a poet and contributes regularly to local poetry events in uh, Missoula and beyond. He has a deep understanding of the significance of growing and sharing food in different ways and their ramifications through society. And we are very fortunate to have his insights this evening. So please join me in welcoming Josh Slotnick. Yeah. All right. So thank you all so much for having me. It's truly an honor to be here. This is a, 
a really well-known place. And when I told people where I was going, they were like, impressed. So I'm impressed that I got to be here. So thanks a lot for having me. So I think from what my, my folks were telling me earlier is that we're going to start this off with some questions. And then you do the clicker answers. But I wanted to do this a little bit differently. Rather than everybody click, we're going to do, a, we're going to make this into a little bit of a game. You got to Unless you're taking notes, close your laptop, don't use your phone. You can look up the answers to these questions really easily, but that wouldn't be very fun. So this, and then I don't want you to do this as an individual either. Bunch up in groups of three, four. I'm going to ask you a question. You guys talk about it for a few seconds, and then we'll see about the answers. All right? That's how we're, that's how we're going to start. OK. How many farm workers are there in the United States? So you, you got to talk to each other. No, no, okay, also, tell me your name. And... So Zach, Zach just asked a good clarification question. Zach said, you mean farmers? No, I, need, I mean farm workers. Not the people that own the farms, not the family who owns a grain farm in Iowa, but how many farm workers? Okay, you got to send in your answer right now. You got it? Okay, zap your answer. Damn, he's right. Three million. So, anybody know? Anybody know how many humans there are in the United States? Three hundred sixty-five million people. So, just wrap your head around that for a moment. Three hundred sixty-five million people, and three million people do the work of growing our food. What do you think that means? Lots and lots of machines. Lots and lots of machines. Yeah. Okay, let's do the next one. Okay, of all those farm workers, what percentage of them are foreign born? Okay, go. You just got like 90 seconds. Go, go, go. Okay, you ready for the answer? So, which little pod believes they know the answer? How about you there in the salmon-colored shirt? Gosh, everybody's getting it right. Y'all studied ahead of time. 80%. Okay, we have an auxiliary question. Of those 80%, this isn't even on here, of those 80%, how many are here without the legal paperwork? Just take a guess. What does anybody think? You can shout it out. 50%. 50%. That's kind of mind-boggling. And there was only 3 million of them. You think this is really popular work? Everybody wants to do this? Oh. Okay, let's do the next one. Okay, big money. Start talking. You got 90 seconds. Okay, you ready to go? How about you in there in the yellow? Yes, the yellow stands out. You're getting everything correct. It's incredible. Wow. Yeah, the average wage, average wage is $16,000 a year. So just hold on to that for a little bit. We're going to come back to this. $16,000 a year. Just let that run around in your head. For doing something that is absolutely invaluable. Right? We could have all the sweater dealers in America leave and life would go on. Right? But these people are absolutely invaluable, and they get paid $16,000 a year. Okay, go for it. 90 seconds. <laughs> okay, we ready? All right, how about you guys? What do you think? What do you guys think? You too, you had it. You were chatting away. What do you think? You said A, million pounds, it's the first wrong answer. But it was a guess, and this is just a game, so there's nothing really wrong. Who wants to guess again? How about in the Colorado shirt? A billion is the right answer. A billion pounds of pesticides. So there's something, something really worthy of note here on those billion pounds of pesticides, every single ounce. And those billion pounds of pesticides 
are full of carcinogens. It says it on the can. These are cancer-causing chemicals. And this crazy thing happened within the last 40, 50, almost 60 years of pesticides in the United States. Anybody know the first pesticide? It was really famous. Three letters. DDT, well done. Okay, anybody guess, can tell me the answer to this. What was the bad rap on DDT? Like, why was DDT such a problem? Can, yeah, exactly. Birds, I heard somebody say eagles. What this means is this pesticide, in ecology speak, it's called persistent. So that means you put it into the world in the form of a spray on a bug, now the bug's got it. And then a, a rodent eats the bug, and then a bird eats the rodent, and the pesticide keeps on going up the food chain. It doesn't ever go away. It's persistent. And this is why people got really mad about DDT. So the folks who make pesticides responded. And now the pesticides that are out there break down in sunlight and rain much, much more quickly. Okay, but wrap your mind around this for a second. If it breaks down really quickly, are there other changes that you'd have to make sure are in there so you know it's going to work? If it's only around for a little while, what do you think? Any guesses on this? What did somebody say back there? Potency, yeah, she's exactly right. It's got to be really, really strong. So there's a measure for the strength of pesticides. It's called the LD50. Has anybody heard this? Lethal dose for 50 adults. And the LD50 of DDT is pretty darn low. It's actually not that toxic, but it's persistent. It lasts forever. Now, if you make a pesticide that's going to break down in 24 hours in sunlight and rain, it better be really potent. The LD50 is crazy high. The stuff that's out now will make you sick, absolutely guaranteed. But since it breaks down really quickly, if you go to the store and buy a head of lettuce or cabbage, you know, you're, you're not going to get sick. Good deal, right? Who is this dangerous for? Exactly, right. So, and most of them are foreign born. Most of those people came here illegally. So that means they risked their lives to get here. Crossing a desert, crossing a river, crossing multiple Central American countries in some cases, risking their lives so they could earn $16,000 working hip deep in toxic chemicals. Would any of you want that for your son or daughter? Let's do the next. Okay. Okay. Who's got this one? How about you, sir? I'm a contemporary. <laughs> D, 14%. Who wants to give another crack at this? Yeah, you're right. 6.4%. That's how much we spend of our income on food. So the next question's gone, or I'll just verbally. Okay, so where do, you think that, where do you think that puts us globally in terms of all, think of all the countries on the earth, who spends the least amount for food, who spends the most, where are we on that spectrum? Yeah, we're not just on the low end, we are the lowest. USA, USA, number one. We spend less money on food than any other set of people on the earth now or ever in the history of humans. The cheapest food possible. We have that. Yeah, so why do, what did you say? Why do we have so many hundred people in America? Why do we have such cheap food? One reason, I gave you the answer already. Who's getting exploited here? Those three, three million farm workers working hip deep in pesticides for $16,000 a year? $16,000 a year? You can make, any of you in this room could make more money than that doing anything. So, when we buy this food, we are to a degree complicit. Now a lot of people don't have any choice. And I think even for people who do have a choice, they just don't know. We're at great distance geographically and intellectually from our food. But I had this thought the other day, imagining kind of a science fiction reality. 
Oh, what's that? It's one of those boutique TV shows out right now. It's like the dark mirror. Is that it? Black mirror. Okay. This could be something from that. Imagine you're at the grocery store, and what's the big grocery store chain in, in Detroit? Detroit? Yeah. None, None in Detroit. <laughs> Myers, okay, you go into Myers and you grab that head of lettuce, and as you're holding it, you could feel in your body everything that the person felt who cut that head of lettuce. So you could feel the stiffness in their back from sleeping in a car, or how they hurt because they've had to pee for four hours but couldn't stop working, or how their heart aches from missing people back where they came from, or what it's like to feel just exploited and treated like crap. You would drop that head of lettuce. <laughs> you are like, I don't want any part of that. But it's cheap food. And we, you will hear this argument that cheap food is really important. And I have a, a friend, another farmer, who brought this up once, so I'm, I'm totally stealing his deal, but I liked it so well. Cheap is, this is a great thing, cheap food. Who wants to be thought of as cheap, as without integrity, as easy to come by, as not worth anything? It's a false, false value. So if you add these things up, all these little questions you just went through, talk amongst yourself for a few seconds and see if we can come up with some values. If you were to describe this food system with an adjective, come up with a couple of them. And we only touched on a few facets of the food system. There's some other parts. Oh, you know, I want to tell you one other thing on this before we go to this. One other piece on our food system. It is fabulously successful at meeting its goal, which is pumping out mad amounts of cheap food. If you live in the right place, so basically that means not deep rural America or in the part of a city that doesn't have a grocery store. If you live in other than those places, you can pretty much get anything you want, whenever you want, for barely any money at all. Cheapest in the world. Anything you want, whenever you want, at very little personal disturbance. That's the ethics of a spoiled child. And that is our, our food system. And we have a whole lot of people that are overweight because the, this food system makes cheap food that isn't very good for you. But I'm not going too deep into that. I want you to think about it for a second. Talk with, talk with your, your friends. Come up with some adjectives. How are we gonna, what are the values inherent in this food system? Go, go, go. Okay, also, we have one more question. We're going to add this to your answer. So keep thinking about those adjectives. We're going to add this to your answer. When I was going off about how our food system is so fabulously successful at pumping out mad amounts of cheap food, most of that cheap food has had the labor of others added to it. And you can buy it in a can or a box at a convenience store or at a grocery store for next to nothing. But that food will make you sick. Expensive food is fresh vegetables. Most of the food that you, have to, you end up buying if you don't have very much money is full of sugar and salt and all kinds of other bad things that will make you sick. And this was supposed to be a little proof of that. Anybody want to take a guess? You don't even have to click. Who wants to guess? They double. They double. Absolutely. Yeah, poverty and diabetes are right over each other. Okay, so some adjectives now. This should feed into it. Who wants to throw out some words on this food system? Y'all got shy with adjectives, but you're good on numbers. Non-sustainable. How about you and the New York hat? Capitalism. Capitalism. You want to unpack that a little bit? What do you mean? <laughs> Individualistic, problematic. Uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> Okay, how about some other ones? Exploitative. Oh, it's fully exploitative of producers and consumers. Broken. It's totally broken. Yeah. We'll go way back. We haven't had anybody from the way back. How about there's a dude in the white t-shirt and blue hat? <laughs> What'd you say? Oh, okay. I missed that, but... Okay, hand up wherever that hand up is. Oh, the light's blocking you out. Okay. Yeah, please. Impersonal. impersonal, for sure. It's fully impersonal. So, if you think about these things, we got exploitive, impersonal, individualistic, 
doesn't sound very good. And yet, at the same time, I think as individuals, we're not really like this. If any one of you saw someone else with their car stuck by the side of the road or in need of something, you would probably help them out. I wonder how is it that as a society we ended up with a food system that doesn't really look like the values we say we hold as people. And my thesis on this, my belief, this is unproven, it's just what I, what I believe, is that our food system works, it fits, because it matches our culture. And we can say things like, we need to fix this food system. And I kind of feel like we've been working on that for 30 years, and I'm, I'm ready to say, I bet we are about at peak food reform. I don't think we're going to see many more CSAs, many more farmer's markets, many more double snaps. All that stuff is great. And I'm just imagining you know what those things are. Right? You know what these things are? Or am I just mumbling stuff? You got them good? Okay. I mean, those are great things, but I think we have hit a wall on this. And I think we've hit a wall because our food system matches our culture. If we're going to change our food system, we're going to have to change our culture, which is a much bigger deal. There are values inherent in our culture that are reflected in our food system. And I want to go off on this a little bit. This is why I think it works so well, why our food system works so well matching our culture. So, thinking back about the food system, how people are treated, and you got a little example of that. It's a little bit like the assembly line at a fast food restaurant. Has anybody ever worked in one of those places? You worked in one? Okay, so when you did your time at Qdoba and you were ready to be gone, tell me your name, please. Claire, were they like, Claire, please, you can't leave. You have these special skills. We'll never replace you. No. And I believe you have special skills, but Qdoba was not making use of them. You were eminently replaceable. And the people who grew the food, those three million people who work hip deep in pesticides, they are eminently replaceable as well. People are not treated like they're special in this situation. And the food that goes through the line at Qdoba is not treated like it's special. It's all eminently replaceable as well. The ethic on how people are treated in this situation, how food and how land, how all these things are treated, it's industrial. That's the key word. And when I say industrial, what I mean is all the emphasis is on production. Not quality. Not quality of food, or the quality of how you treat people, or the quality of the product you end up with. It's just about production. And unfortunately, I feel like that is also the ethic of our culture. Okay, here, I'm gonna, I, I have to prove that to you now. So, I live in a little bubble. I know it. I live in this little upper middle class bubble. Of liberal people in a beautiful place. And I run into my contemporaries at the grocery store, that beautiful store that you and I went to. And I run into my friend, I'm thinking of a friend specifically, my friend Jim, who works for the Nature Conservancy, does real good work, you know. I'm like, hey, Jim, how's it going? And he'll tell me a real answer because we're friends. And the answer is the same as I hear from everybody else who are one of my contemporaries when I run into him. What do you want to guess what the answer is? How's it going? What's he saying? It's not good. He's giving me a real answer. What do you think it is? How about you? you Anybody want to take a guess? Swamped. I'm so swamped. I'm tired. Oh, I got so much going on. It'll be fine after the first of the month when I get this report out and oh, I got the kids doing this and I got that. It's going to get better, but I'm just swamped. And everybody I meet answers that question the same way. And think about this right now while you and I are here, right here doing this. As we speak, the email is piling up like snow in a blizzard. <laughs> just, you can hear it, right? And when and how many of you, maybe that dude that I asked a question of and he said, his, and he said Pete, right? maybe he was thinking about all the stuff he's supposed to be doing right now. <laughs> Have any of you thought, yeah, there's this guy ranting and raving, but I, I got this test tomorrow and I got this paper and I got to be at work and I'm like, When's my, when am I out of here? So I got to get to all my email because the people that I report to, even though they're my friends and colleagues, that's what they care about. I got to bust it out. It doesn't matter that I'm trying to do good work. What matters is I bust it out. None of the people I work with and work for are going to say to me, 
on a Friday afternoon. Did you make a good meal for your family yesterday? Just curious. Make sure that happened. Did you ride your bike today? Have you exercised? Did you have meaningful conversations with friends and family? Do you believe you spent your time in a worthwhile way? No one is going to ask those questions. We judge one another primarily along one ethic, and that is production. Did you get all that email done? Did you write that grant? Did you raise that money? Did you make that phone call? And this disease permeates everything. It goes from people who do good work to people who do work that's just to pay the rent. And it crosses socioeconomic boundaries. I am very fortunate, and I, had, I, I was born halfway up the ladder, so I don't get a whole lot of credit. My neighbor lives in a crummy-ass little trailer. She works two jobs, works hard, hard. Two shifts, working hard. She's always busy. She's got no time for anything. I work hard too. Family business, and I've got this other stuff. I'm going hard. Both of us are going full on. Doesn't matter that I'm relatively rich and she's relatively poor. Both of our lives are, ru are ruled by a production ethic. So how this fits back into that food system that I feel like will not change anymore until we change our culture? So you work till 7 o'clock at night. Well, you, you're driving home at 7 o'clock. After you did your full work day, 5 o'clock didn't mean nothing. You went past that, making phone calls, banging out emails, picking some kid up, doing this and that. You were supposed to be making dinner. Oh, look. Oh, look. There's salvation on the horizon. There is a drive through Yeah, the drive through works because it fits the rhythm of our lives. As the, as the does, does the frozen pizza. And if you got a lot of money and fancy taste, Blue Apron works that way too. Do you all know what that is? It does not fit. If you were to tell your professors or your bosses or your colleagues, you know, I've got to be out of here by 4.30 because I've got to ride my bike home. And then it's going to take me an hour and 20 minutes, an hour and 15 minutes to cook and clean because I've got to chop all that broccoli and cut the lettuce and heat up the noodles and do it like you're actually supposed to do it. The opposite of production, I believe, is intention. Think about that, intention. So instead of valuing what you do by how much you get done, the value is on how you do it. How do you live? You make specific choices like, I'm going to make a point of having real conversations with people I care about every day, even people I don't know that well. I'm going to do the best I can to transport myself in the least carbon obnoxious way possible. I'm going to cook real food. Cooking real food means you have a sense of the history of that food before you hit it with your knife and cutting board. And if you're not starting with a knife and cutting board, you're not cooking. So back to the food system. It works because it fits around our production ethic. And we're going to have to change the way that we live to generate some new values in order to have a food system that matches that. I feel like our culture comes first and then the food system wraps around it. You can stick with my claim that we're at peak food reform right now. So this may beg the question, OK, great, Mr. Fancy Pants from some faraway place. How are you going to change the culture? And there's some irony in this, and that I think part of the answer is agricultural. But not the kind of agriculture where three million people do all the work for all the rest of us hip deep in pesticides. It's a completely different kind of agriculture. And I'm calling it community agriculture. And this, I don't believe, can save us all in terms of food, but I think it can start to turn this big giant ship of culture a little bit away from production and a little bit towards intention. And when I say community agriculture, I mean when we are growing food together in public to address other issues beyond the need for nutritious calories. Things like job creation, youth development, self-determination, my friend Malik runs such an organization and I work for one too. So what I'm going to do now is tell you a little bit about the organization that I work for and how these values come into the world. Because I believe when people come to these places and engage with these places, they leave transformed. 
And they take that sense of, the sense of values around intention, though they wouldn't say it that way. They take it with them into the next thing they do, whether it has anything to do with food or not. We have to start putting different values out into the world beyond production if we have any hope of repairing our food system. Okay, now I'm going to go to Garden City Harvest. Does that work for you? Um, let's wait. We'll just, we'll just talk first. Okay, so it was the mid-90s in my town, Missoula, Montana, and we'd had this political revolution nationally. It was called the Republican Revolution, and Newt Gingrich became the Speaker of the House of Representatives, and Bill Clinton was the president, and these guys were like at war with each other over who was the most powerful man in the United States. And Newt Gingrich came out with this plan called the Contract with America that people joked was a contract on America. And one of the tenets of this contract on America was he was going to get rid of welfare as we know it. So it gutted the food stamp program. And it worked. Yeah, people weren't getting food stamps anymore. That didn't mean they were getting jobs. It just means they couldn't get food stamps. Well, there was a woman in my town who works for the health department for the WIC program. Anybody know the WIC program? All right who was quite alarmed by this because she thought and recognized, where are all these people going to go? If they lose their food stamps, where are they going to go? Where do you think they would go? Where would you go? Say it again. Food pantries, food pantries or food banks. They were going to come to our food bank. And our food bank wasn't very big, and it was well stocked with that bad food from Walmart that will make you sick and overweight if you eat it. And it's not because the people at the food bank didn't understand food, it's because that's what they could get for free. So my friend said, we got to figure out how to get some fresh vegetables to the food bank. Beyond that, she did this really smart thing that was a great lesson for me in learning about doing community development. She said, this is something we need, but we don't fully understand the problem. So instead of dreaming up a sexy solution and then pitching it to people like they do in the tech world, what we should do is cast this wide net, invite all kinds of people, anybody we think might be interested into a conversation, and try and wrap our minds around this. And we had a few months of conversations, and people dropped out because it got boring and they didn't like it. And after a few months, we had distilled out what we thought was the problem in our town, and we called it food security. And I know other people have used that word in other places, those words, and at the time we didn't know that, we didn't invent it, we just decided it for ourselves. And what we decided was that for us, food security meant two things. One, everybody should have regular, easy access to high-quality food whenever they want it. You don't have to worry that the food bank isn't going to have food for you. Everybody should have access to good food all the time. And two, we should produce food in such a way that we can produce food again next year and the year after and the year after on that same spot. So we started up. We wrote a a bunch of grants, one of them hit. We started this partnership between the university and we started this brand new little nonprofit called Garden City Harvest. And we started one community garden that we put next to a trailer park because people at the trailer park don't have yards, they can't grow food, there's no land to grow food on, and they could walk over. And then we started this two acre farm in partnership with the university where students like y'all would learn about how to grow food. And in the act of learning, it would produce food that we could then bring to the food bank. So we started up. There were three of us, this little tiny farm, and a two-acre community garden. Little did I know that local food was going to become like a national thing. And what we were doing became popular. And it grew and grew and grew. And we went from this one two-acre university farm to a 10-acre university farm. The one community garden to now we have 20 different sites. Some of them are school gardens, some of them are community gardens. The big thing that I learned out of this though, was that the food wasn't the deal. The food was not the big thing. It was the experience of growing the food that was the big thing. And that's where all those values come into play. So I'm going to describe this a little bit. So when working with university students, I noticed fairly early on that something very unusual was happening. And I was quite young myself then. People said to me things like, what's up with those farm kids? They just like act different. You see them out in town and they're just like a little thing. 
They show up in the morning, and it's cold in the morning in Montana. We don't have any humidity, so that means it's cold in the mornings, hot during the day. It's like a desert, even though the geography doesn't look like a desert. So they show up in the mornings, it's cold, they're wearing sweatshirts. It gets hot by 10 o'clock, they take off their sweatshirts, and because they're 20 years old, they forget. Then the next day, they come without a sweatshirt, and they put on somebody else's sweatshirt. So what does that say about this group of people, that they're wearing each other's clothes without permission? Anybody, what, what do you think? You can guess us? Does that lose you? They all have scabies. They all have scabies, that's it. No, they really like each other. They trust each other. Sorry. It's all right. That was good. We needed something. We needed something. Yeah. Has anybody, uh, anybody ever done farm work here with someone else? Nice. You may know about this next little thing I'm going to say then. If you're doing something farmish and kind of tedious, maybe you're shoveling a big pile of manure, maybe you're weeding carrots, and you do this, for a couple hours with a person, you're gonna learn all kinds of things about them, right? The work, this work is humble work. It's close to the earth, it brings us close to the earth, and the borders that separate people often erode away because we're right there together, weeding carrots or shoveling manure. So you do this for a day and you learn stuff about each other. You do it every day for a bunch of months and you become something way better than just people who know each other. It's kind of magical. So we came up with a recipe to describe this. You take small groups of people, have them do humble labor with tangible, beautiful results, and it equals a transformative experience. The people involved become attached to each other, to the place, and to the activity. And anyone who walks in the gate is welcome to join in. And this works, I've seen this work w with uh, teenagers that we work with who come from really, really rough circumstances, and it works with college students who have all the privilege in the world. It pretty much works with everybody. People get attached to each other, to the place, to the activity, and everything they do reflects that. So now they become like this little community. They're going to try really hard to make sure those carrots are well weeded, that the carrots are washed well, that the lettuce is presented beautifully when they're done. Because their work reflects their place in this community that is now part of who they are. Quality has surpassed production. Inclusion has surpassed exclusion and exploitation. They care for each other, they care for the place. What I noticed is how they describe the farm, their words literally change. At the beginning, they say, where do you want us to put, to put your irrigation pipe? Like it's my irrigation pipe, it's not my pipe. Doesn't take too long, and they say, shouldn't we be watering our lettuce? Don't we need to fix our fence? The farm becomes theirs in the most real way. That's the transformative experience. That's a set of values that's completely different than let's value everything based on production and squeeze out of these fine people everything we can get and out of the land. It's completely different. So my belief on this is if we have more organizations like this, like the one Malik works with, the one that I work with, and there's tons of them. This is actually happening. It's growing around the country. More organizations doing community agriculture. We're not going to feed everybody, but we're going to start putting people out there in the world who act a little bit differently. And for some of the kids that we work with, the teenagers that come from the worst of circumstances, they don't go from jail to Yale, but they have a reference point for how life can be when you're part of a high-functioning, meaningful community. And that reference point didn't exist before. And when they go to decide on their next thing, they're looking at that as, I know how life can be, how does this feel right now? And they didn't have that before. One of the best things we do with teenagers that I'm most proud of is this thing called Mobile Market. So we get teenagers from Missoula Youth Drug Court. And Youth Drug Court is not a courtroom, but it's a program, and they have to work their way through this program. One of the things they can do is come work for us. If they come work with us, they get paid minimum wage. They work side by side with the university students, 
And the university students are very excited to be there. So excited they paid to be there. And we have a, a smaller group of teenagers than university students. So that university students set a cultural tone and the teenagers kind of rise to it. And twice a week, they do mobile market. That's what I was getting at. Which means they take food they've been harvesting, put it in this big van, drive it off to low-income housing for senior citizens. Now, these teenagers I'm talking about have been in trouble. They are regarded by most adults as a problem. They are a problem. They're a hassle. When they show up at these low-income housing centers, uh, low-income residences for senior citizens, they set up what look like mock farmer's markets, a bunch of beautiful food on a table, and then the seniors come out to get the food. Do you think they respond to these teenagers as if they're a problem? No. Older people know what vegetables are. <laughs> They're really excited to see these vegetables. And we sell everything cheap. Nothing's more than a dollar. It's our food. We can sell it for what we want. And they respond to these teenagers like saviors. And there's kind of a culture, cultural ecology that's going on here. Like in a, in a a biological ecology, the way one organism lives, makes space for another organism. There's a cultural ecology going on here in that what these older people need, which is to be tended to and reminded that they're alive and human and real, that happens with these teenagers. And the teenagers need to know that they are of value. That happens because of the older people. These guys are like hand and glove. They fit perfectly together. And you see transformation. It's not jail to Yale, but it's people who did not think much of themselves starting to wake up a little bit. And I mentioned these words self-determination, and this is what I see in these teenagers, because they have started to believe the rap on who they are, that they are a problem. And they've internalized that. It's terrible. But what happens through this work of growing this food, you can see the tangible results of your work, you can see the looks on the people's faces who you're interacting with, they start to believe a different narrative. They start to create that same narr that narrative for themselves. I am of worth. Look, I can tell. If I wasn't a worthwhile person, I wouldn't have been able to make this stuff, and these people wouldn't be receiving me in this way. It totally works. Now, it doesn't work in all cases. Some people's obstacles are just too big, but it works for an awful lot of them. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is show you some pictures of this. There we go, right? We'll do some pictures, and then we'll do some questions. There we go. So this is the city where I live. This is Missoula, Montana, which is very small compared to Ann Arbor or Detroit. There's about uh, 70,000 people that live in the city, about 100,000 that live in the county. The big issue we have financially and demographically is that Missoula has become a very popular place to live. It's beautiful there. Nas Malik. I mean, it's very, you look up and it's beautiful. And because it's beautiful, lots of people moved there because they wanted to live in a beautiful spot. And once they were there, they figured out how to make a living in some way that they liked. So that means we have all kinds of this like artisanal beer and distilleries and bakeries and all that kind of stuff. And then more people came and more people came. And housing got really expensive. There's this thing called the Housing Affordability Index. Does anybody know what that is? This is when you overlay cost of living and housing. And our housing affordable, affordability index has plummeted every year for nearly 20 years, which means it's really hard to afford a house. We're basically at full employment, something like 4%. Like basically everybody who can have a job has a job. And most of those people can't afford to buy a house. It's just too expensive. So our food bank the one I described earlier, the little tiny food bank, now it's really big. They raised like $2 million, built this beautiful state-of-the-art food bank with all kinds of spaces for programming and kid stuff. It's really an amazing building, and they're full of people every day. Something like 11,000 visits a year. 11,000 people and 20-some-odd thousand visits. Okay, I'm going to do that. This is right in the heart of the city. This river runs through the city, and I'm going to go off on a little tangent here just because this is important to me. This river that runs right through the city was, for a little while, the longest Superfund site in the United States. The longest one, from the city of Butte all the way to, to Missoula. And, you know, people could say, like, oh, that's just terrible, you know. And for a long time, Missoula was a beat-up, 
place. There were four paper mills. Uh, it smelled kind of bad. When I went to college here, this river had this green color in it. Anybody know chemistry? You want to guess why the river had a green color? It was an algae. That's a good guess, though. Copper, exactly. The copper mines in Butte. Yeah. Well, millions and millions, I don't know how many tens, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars went into it, cleaned up the river. The, the, the paper mills got shuttered because of weakness in international markets and NAFTA and wood coming from Canada and all kinds of other crazy stuff, and the paper mills went away. The air got clean. The city passed a wood stove ban, so you couldn't put wood, you had to take the wood stoves out of your house. We're near the woods, so when I was a student living in a crummy student rental, having a wood stove was a normal and cheap thing to do. They made all the wood stoves go away, river got cleaned up, the air got cleaned up, and people started moving there. It's kind of mind-bending, you think, well, if you lose your big economic base, obviously jobs will go and the economy will plummet. And we were in just the right spot and the stars aligned just the right way where the exact opposite happened. We made it through some accidents into a really nice place and then people started coming. So this is right in the heart of the city and we can walk, you can walk over that bridge and you'll see eagles coming down and grabbing fish and people fly fishing and playing in kayaks right there in the heart of the city. So you leave the city and go uphill just about 10 minutes. There's uphill to the peas farm. That's it right there on, the, on your left. You can do the next one. That's our barn. These are students out working in the field, students and teenagers. This is spring. You can see that uh, we've got brassicas bolting. So I believe that on a farm, pretty much anybody can learn to do anything. And every time we have something to do is an opportunity for someone to learn something. So this person, oh, her name was Kim. She had never used a tractor a few months in. Look, she's doing some seriously careful tractor work in a hoop house, totally on it. How do you think that makes her feel? Kind of badass, doesn't it? <laughs> now, how many people can do that? Anybody could, but you have to learn how. You have to be in the right context. And she is badass. She has great skills and care, and she did a super good job. This is tool is called a spader. It does a more of a conservation tillage than a rototiller. So I was talking about earlier those students working together. This is a prime example of that. They're laying out mulch in, in onions and do this together all morning. And we do this great thing at noon when the morning's done. We eat lunch together. Very important. Two students each day and one youth harvest kid, so two students and a teenager, take turns making lunch for everybody else out of the food we've been growing. And at the beginning of the summer, we all pitch in $20 to buy grains and beans and oil and stuff like that. And we usually make it through the year with like 30 bucks a person for a whole summer of lunches. So you work from 8 to noon, and then you roll into our barn at noon, and there's lunch spread out for you. How does that feel? Feels super good. So I'm gonna go off another little tangent, but we'll circle back, I promise. I saw this documentary a bunch of years ago called Happy. Anybody know this one? The documentarians interviewed people all over the world around what made them happy. And they came up with this idea that there's a scale. On zero, zero is suicidal, and 100 is the Buddha, completely content. That first 50 points, it's not up to you. It's by virtue of your birth. It's genetics. Were you born on the right side of the bed with the cup half full or were you born the opposite way? Were you born into abject poverty and exploitation and horrible treatment by the dominant culture or were you born with a higher degree of privilege? You don't get to choose. First 50 points, just as is. But the next 50 points, it's up to y'all. According to the documentarians of Happy. They said it's really pretty, pretty straightforward. You have to do a set of things every day. Ready for these? Okay, y'all are going to start doing this now, right? Every day, you got to be outside a little bit. Every day, you have to be outside a little bit, at least. You have to feel the elements on your body. You have to move your body every day. You can't just sit all day. Every day, you have to have meaningful conversations with other people. Real conversations. 
You have to do something at least every day that you actually believe is really important. And this is wonderful in that it's totally up to you. There's a dude that I buy car insurance from. He's so into it. He's like, I helped you today. And he did. Like, it wouldn't be enough for me, but it's enough for him. <laughs> huh? You get to pick. You got to do something that's really meaningful, you believe is meaningful every day. You have to experience what some people call flow every day. I had a philosophy professor years ago, who, he was a German guy, he said, engagement. And what it means is you are so into doing what you're doing that time passes in a different way. You look up, you're like, whoa, what happened? First time this ever happened to me, I was a college student and I was doing ceramics in the ceramics lab. Anybody ever do ceramics? It's really great. I was, I was building this sculpture and I realized all of a sudden, man, I am so thirsty. And I looked up and it was like eight o'clock and I'd been there since four in the afternoon. I'm like, whoa, what happened? Flow is what happened, engagement. I was fully into what I was doing. And I'm bringing this up right now because these kids at the peas farm, they're really happy. And almost every day, when we ring the bell at noon for lunch, the person across from me will be like, no way, it's noon already? Yeah. The morning went like that. Because they're outside, moving their bodies, having great conversations. I've made this joke plenty of times. So many times I don't think it's even a joke that conversation is our best crop. If you weed carrots across somebody, a bed from somebody for two hours, you're going to have a good conversation. So that's what these people are doing here. And then when they finish, they get to go eat lunch. And when you put lunch on top of all those other things, oh man, you just sealed the deal. <laughs> Riley, great kid, very proud of uh, the food he grew. As you can see in the next picture, that uh, cabbage as big as his head. <laughs> you know. And look, the carrots and cabbage and onions doesn't look great. And right behind him there in the gray fog is uh, 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 some mountains, the Rattlesnake Wilderness Area, which you can't see, but it's right there. Okay. This is the farm looking south. Uh, anybody, you guys use this stuff at all? Rime? We use a lot of Rime because it's cold in springtime. Uh, we, this is us setting up for a, a party. We built that barn uh, out of straw bales when we first got there, well, within a year or so of when we first got there. Our little organization has become much more established. Way back when, when we built some of this stuff, we were scrappy and small and had to beg and borrow, and it's a little different now, and I kind of miss the old days a little bit. Now, I come from a market farm background. I learned market farming before I learned the community agriculture side of it. And in the market farm world, your food has to be beautiful. You're putting it on display at farmer's market. You're bringing it to restaurants. It just has to be beautiful. Local organic is not enough. It has to be beautiful. And I've really enjoyed passing that ethic on because it's an ethic of quality. Remember, it's not production, it's quality. We didn't have 10 billion bunches of carrots, but look how beautiful those carrots are. It's really important to me that when people walk into our barn to pick up their CSA and they see the food all spread out on a table, that they ooh and ah, I'm like, whoa, it's really beautiful. Because it is really beautiful. The work is beautiful. The food should reflect that. Look at that. This was just last summer, and we had just a banner strawberry year. And the next slide's just kind of fun. Uh, it's my buddy's kid. <laughs> That's what strawberries are about. <laughs> and this is my daughter, Tasha, made this thing when she was, made this strawberry thing, and she was watching this kid, Remy, and she took that picture. because They made it together, and he like, couldn't wait to get at it. There you go. Broccoli is a barometer of fertility. You know that you have good ground if you can grow good broccoli. And uh, look at that broccoli. Eggplants next to it. This was last fall. Uh, winter squash is a really big crop for us that we custom grow for the food bank. So I mentioned we grow food for the food bank. Some of that is leftover CSA food and some of it is specific to the food bank. And we grow winter squash specifically for the food bank. And this was the day we got the last of it in. So we harvest it, and then we put it in this hoop house that's empty in the fall, and it cures there. It means the moisture goes out of, out of the rind, and that rind gets really tough. And one of the great, wonderful, magical things about winter squash is it stores without refrigeration, and it tastes really good, and it's good for you. Which is why we bring it to the food bank. They can store all this winter squash in their warehouse. People can eat it three months from then. And it was a great winter squash harvest. Anybody want to guess why we put table legs in buckets? <laughs> 
No. Yes, you got it right, sir. Yeah, our, our beloved cat retired. <laughs> She's still around, but she doesn't do work like she used to. And the mice were climbing up there and eating the squash. So this stopped them from doing that. But I put this in there so you know I'm not just making this up. <laughs> That's me. And there's the beloved cat. Yeah, looking south towards our field. And uh, I think that's it. And I think, did I get it right? We were stopping at 8 and we wanted 15 minutes for questions. So how about that? Check, check, check. Okay, we're going to open up the floor for questions. Uh, any questions for Josh? And if we're, while we're waiting, while you're formulating your questions, I'll ask the first one. Right. You talked about the need to transform the culture generally. Yes. Yeah. And you talked about community agriculture as being one way to do that. What are some yeah. other ways that you might suggest that we okay. transform the culture? It's a great question. So I believe that that same recipe can work in other contexts. People working together, humble labor with tangible results. So one example nearby us is a, a community bike shop. So you can roll in with your bike, and there's somebody there who'll help you get it fixed. So that sounds fairly simple. Where's the transformation? I don't get the big deal. Well, it's not all about money. And what I think is so important about this great bike shop is the people that are helping you fix your bike, for the most part, were these homeless guys that had nothing going on that wandered into this bike shop about 10 years ago because they had bikes, so the only way they could get around. And in exchange for getting a bike, they had to do this training, learn how to help other people, and a core group of these people has remained on. So you go into this bike shop, you're treated with respect no matter who you are. You don't have to have a fancy bike. It doesn't cost any money. The idea is to get you back rolling along. And the people who do the work have experienced the same kind of bonding and value to themselves as the people who are farming. Anytime we're doing things where we can see results, where you're working with somebody, it doesn't have to be that you built a chair, you could have helped a person. Again, it's not about production. In this case, it's about getting people on bicycles, or actually the people who are getting their bike fixed are doing a turn for the people who are teaching them. They're providing them with the opportunity to do meaningful work. It could be around construction, it could be around teaching. It can be around almost anything where you're making something or providing a service where the goals are quality and integrity and inclusion and care and not that other crap. While you're formulating your questions, Catherine has a question. So Josh, really fascinating. Thanks for your insights. I'm curious to know whether you've ever had the experience that a, a farmer that was in the industrial system decided to convert his or her farm or their farm to the, 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 the style that you described in your community farm? So the closest I can come with that, I have a friend who's a grain farmer uh, up north in very, very rural Montana. He went off to college in uh, UC Davis to study like microbiology or something. He left the farm. He was a sciencey person. He's done with that farm. It was his grandparents' farm. Then his dad, mom and dad ran it, and he left to go be a scientist. Perfectly fine. He gets a call one day from his dad. says, Can you, you got to help me. I'm out of ideas, and we can't make our payments, and we're going to lose the place. My friend Bob was really bothered by this. So he went back to the farm and ended up changing things around, not to make a community farm, but to make an organic farm, which is different. And I feel like when I said we're kind of at peak farm reform, I don't think we're going to see that many more local organic farms until we get this cultural shift. But one thing my friend Bob found out, he looked at his family's books, and I mentioned all those pesticides, and he could figure it out looking at the books how much his parents were spending per acre on chemicals, on herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers. And it was a lot per acre, something like $400 an acre, and they had like 4,000 acres, which is kind of normal for a grain farm in central Montana. But his dad pointed out, well, that's okay that we have that expense because we get about $400 per acre in federal subsidy. So that covers it. So just wrap your mind around that for a second. So my friend Bob had this big insight. And his insight was, 
My family's not being subsidized. We take that $400 per acre and we pay our chemical bill with it. And that's your all's money. Who's being subsidized here? Was it Bob's family farm? Who was being subsidized? Yeah, the chemical company was being subsidized. So my friend Bob had this realization like, wait a minute, maybe we could stop paying the chemical company. And then he kept digging and he was looking into the prices they were getting, his family was getting for grain. Terrible, terrible. Four companies buy 80% of the grain in the United States. Four companies. And they all share a bunch of people on their boards of directors. They set the price for grain. This is not the free market. This is 35 old white guys going, oh, this year we're going to pay $2.80. Because what are you going to do if you've got a silo full of grain? You're just going to suck it up and take the $2.80. So my friend Bob thought, if we could sell this on our own and ditch General Mills and Archer Daniels Midland, we maybe could make more money. And if we didn't spend all that money on chemicals, we could keep more money. And he began a transformation toward an organic farm. So I do know somebody who did that. And this was 25 years ago. And now, and anybody run into the grain called Kamut? Ever heard of Kamut? He's the father of Kamut. <laughs> yeah. So raise your hands if you have a question to ask. There's one in the middle. OK, wait till the mic gets to you. We have Mariah right here. How do you get more privileged kids involved or people involved if most of your work is for maybe low income? Or so it's a good question. So at the university farm where I work, the, the main labor force are university students who take the farm as a class. So that's why they're there. And then in, that's the student, the student farm. We have community gardens. We started with one. Now there's, like I said, 20 between the community gardens and school gardens. And we strategically located the community gardens next to Housing for low-income people or housing where low-income people live where there also isn't land to garden on and that's how and th that worked out really well We found that we could put a community garden on a beautiful park But if nobody nearby was into a community garden nobody would travel for it So in terms of getting kids of privilege, it's worked out really well. They want to do it And I feel like they want to do it because They're most of them are studying environmental studies and They've learned upside down and sideways how we have screwed up the earth and what do they get to do with this knowledge? They get to write a paper for some middle-aged person to read and hand back to them. And this is not a very satisfying experience. Growing carrots is. Harvesting tomatoes is. Making compost. You did something. You feel real. You moved your body outside. You could see what you did. So people want to do this work. And I feel, in some ways, very heartened about the future because the students that I have, the people, that, the young people that I run into on a daily basis are not most interested in wealth as their end goal. They are most interested in doing meaningful work. And unfortunately, we have a poverty of meaningful work even as we have poverty of poverty. So getting them to come out to the farm hasn't been a problem. They get credits. It's a class. It's not a club. It's not an extra thing. Environmental Studies 396. They can take it spring, summer, and fall. Two credits in spring, two in fall, six in summer. It satisfies upper division requirements. They can get a certificate in community agriculture. So it's like, a, it's like taking Shakespeare chemistry. They, they line up. Um, what do you think this would look like in Detroit, a city like Detroit that's very different than Missoula? Montana? The first thing I would do is ask Malik. <laughs> that's what I would do. So you should, you should take that, sir. Uh, I'm not going to take that, but there's many people in Detroit who you could ask, and I think, I think what he's describing is actually happening in Detroit. There's lots of people doing very similar work in Detroit. Right. Yes. Um, I had a question about, I think you recommended a lot of like downstream approaches, but like from upstream policy level, like what do you recommend there? Oh man, that is a really good question. Did you, did you get, what, what, did you all hear what she said? Was that a no? What's your name? Tori said, how about upstream approaches? Everything I was talking about was kind of on the downstream. Upstream means policy. So what can government do on this? And these are, these are good questions. And this is not my main field of expertise, but I would say like on the scale that my friend Bob the grain farmer works, we could direct subsidies away from how they're structured right now, which is based on how many acres you have of commodity crops. You'll get a certain amount of money in the mail and say, 
We'll give you money if you farm in a different way. We'll help subsidize your transition to more sustainable methods. And we can do things on a local level, like in our city, where we have chunks of unused ground, and it can be hard and difficult bureaucratically to gain access to that land. And we could pass some rules on a little higher level up that said something like if there's abandoned ground, nobody knows who owns it, or the person who owns it hasn't been there for a certain number of years, it can be made available. People better at policy would answer this than me, but I think that there's kind of where there's a will, there's a way. Like if we want to do these things, we can, and at the highest levels of policy, we haven't recognized it. But hopefully, as you all age out and up, um, that will change. I, has that been wrestled with in Detroit? I'm sure it has. But. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So we have a question here and a question here. Hi, my name's Casey. Um, hey, Casey. I'm wondering about how you started talking about the three million um, farm workers, yeah. how mo a lot of them are undocumented, yeah. without their families, um, all of them are exploited by the yeah. cap capitalist food system, and how those people will play into this like cultural and like food system, the shift that you're yeah. proposing. So if I was to describe a way better food system than the one we have, instead of a very small amount of very large farms run on an industrial scale, we would have a very large amount of very small farms run in, on a human scale all over the country. And I'm dreaming, so I'm gonna dream big. And the big dream would be similar things would happen in other places so people would not have to risk their lives to get here to get a crummy job. And in the same dream, food would not be 6.4% of our annual income, but would be double that. So people who produce food in a real way could earn a real living. And then, I'm still dreaming, right? Wages generally would go up so that no one wouldn't have enough money to buy good food. So this fall, just through circumstance, I spent a week in Denmark. And when I was in Denmark, our federal government was debating this new tax overhaul. Do you remember this from a couple months ago? Does anybody remember the presiding logic in the tax overhaul? Anybody remember it? What would it be that you're nodding? Exactly, exactly, exactly. So we would cut taxes. And in my mind, taxes are how we collectively work together. We pool our money so we can do things that we can't do individually. So the logic behind that tax cut was cut taxes. People won't have to pay nearly as much taxes, especially rich people. And then they'll take that money and they'll start businesses and it'll all trickle down. So I'm walking around Denmark with my wife, listening to National Public Radio, because I'm just exactly how you would assume the stereotype of me is. <laughs> and I'm listening to this and you know, and I'm walking along and we're in Denmark. The night before, we had a great chat with this family that's hosting my 21-year-old daughter who's going to school in Denmark for this semester. And they said they paid 60% of their income in taxes. And they weren't super wealthy. It was just like a regular house, regular place. So I'm walking around, looking around Denmark. I'd never been to Denmark before. Spent a lot of time in other countries. I'd never been to a place that was more developed than the United States. It was nicer, just straight up nicer. Everything's nicer. Just turn up the notch, everything's nicer. Turn up the dial, right? 60% in taxes. And the place was booming. Like economy happening everywhere. Little stores, little shops, people selling stuff, people coming and going. So many people on bicycles, like a third of the traffic on bicycles. Everything's built to a human scale. It's like some kind of paradise for a liberal, you know? <laughs> it's like blown away. And that voice in my earbuds is saying, if taxes go up, economy will suffer. I'm like, wait a minute. This place is better. Their economy is better. More shit's happening. And my dollars didn't go very far. It's like when you have dollars and you go to Mexico and you're like, wow, I'm wealthy now. I'll get a second one of those, you know? Because you, your dollar is so strong. I was in Denmark going, I don't know, eight bucks for a cup of tea? I think I might just do without today. Because you know? the dollar's weak. Because Denmark is better economically. So in terms of policy, what if we took more money and put it towards public infrastructure? Raised wages. Imagining that prosperity is a ladder, and I said I got born pretty far up. What if everybody started pretty far up? Because everybody had health, education, a standard wage, a good place to live. I didn't see any homeless people in Denmark. 
It just seemed like the logic that was being pushed was upside down and it was right in front of my face. So it was especially stark. Okay, we have 90 seconds for the yeah. last question and the answer. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, thanks for your talk. Um, there are certainly benefits to living in a society like the U.S. that values productivity. Yeah. Um, including an abundance of food, the best health care, and the best technology. So how can we best reconcile uh, the two seemingly contradictory ideas of valuing production and also valuing, valuing uh, like you mentioned, ethics and inclusion? Yeah, so, so the first thing I'd say is we don't have the best health care. We're like number 29 or something. Not that it's not good, it's good, but it's like number 29. And, and uh, the other part though, I think doing things in a way that shows you care for people does not mean that you throw out technology. You use the right tools. That tractor tool, that's a really good tool. We're not in there just with pitchforks. But we're doing, using those same high quality tools in a way that honors the people who are using them. And it means making space for living a good life. Kind of slowing down a little bit. I think we could be madly productive, just as productive as we need to be if we didn't work 50 hours a week. So we should still keep using the good tools and demand of one another that we treat each other well and treat ground well too.